Hello and welcome to Brainwaves. Uh, today on Brainwaves I feature Dr. Phil Corlett, uh, Assistant Professor at Yale University. Um, Phil is also a recipient of the recent Rising Star, Ri Rising Star Translational Research Award offered by Imro and Janssen Pharmaceutical. Um, to, and his proposal is, is actually very exciting in that um, it may offer us a deeper understanding how the brain produces the mind and also um, an original therapy for schizophrenia, potentially, potentially in the relatively near term. Um, Dr. Corlett, uh, thanks so much for appearing on Brainwaves today. Thank you for having me. Very, very, very good to have you on the show. Um, so, uh, and also thank you for doing the work that you do on behalf of people with schizophrenia. I have schizophrenia myself and I really appreciate it when the scientist does work for people with mental illness. So, thanks, Phil. It's my pleasure. Okay. So, um, I, I was reading online a, a blog post that you wrote as a guest blogger on PsyCurious for Scientific American, and it was extremely interesting. So, so not, I mean, I, I, can, I can tell viewers that you're a great communicator, for one thing, oh. and you're also a very great neuroscientist. And I, I wanted to ask you, um, how did your interests in, in these two areas develop in parallel? And how do they dovetail to help you, like, enhance your work to help people with mental illness? Well, I really love what I do, and I'm very excited about it. And I really want to tell people about it. And I found that engaging in these sort of scientific communication uh, activities, like writing the blog, um, really helps me think very clearly about my work and helps me to not to use so many technical terms, and maybe I think get to a more deep understanding of what we're doing. Um, I also like being able to discuss what I do with people, and I really appreciate their feedback. So not just my colleagues, but patients that we work with, uh, other people with the illness, um, and the public more broadly. I think uh, it's a responsibility of a scientist to uh, communicate as clearly as they possibly can. Sometimes it's quite hard for us, but I think it's important to try. I agree. I definitely agree, and and this is this is part of the communications that uh, that you do, and that, uh, uh, yeah. So another step, <laughs> and they say right. that uh, they say that uh, uh, a great scientist is able to explain their work to their grandmother in in two sentences, right? That's right. <laughs> so so uh, if your grandmother's watching, then uh, then we can test <laughs> that. <laughs> but, uh, I'll ask her to sign on. <laughs> um, so. Um, so your writing star proposal is based on a very interesting theory that you come up with about how uh, the mind uh, can sort of unhealthily work to produce delusions and then the accompanying symptoms of anhedonia uh, based on a new theory of the brain called Bayesian brain theory. Uh, can you explain a bit about Bayesian brain theory and like how, how that led to your inspiration about this theory of how delusions develop? Sure, absolutely. So um, the Bayesian brain theory, it actually dates back to Hermann von Helmholtz, who was a, a, a German polymath. Many people describe him as a genius. Um, he had this theory that what we perceive in our world uh, is really driven by our expectations and our past experiences. Um, so we basically learn to see things and hear things in a particular way. Um, this is manifest in the brain, in how the brain's anatomically structured, um, if you think about things like the visual system, for example, there's a sort of hierarchical arrangement where information comes in through your eyes um, in a bottom-up fashion and expectations are specified top-down. Um, we think that even single neurons have expectations about their incoming inputs and they express those expectations um, by shuttling different types of receptors into and out of the cell membrane. And the proposal really um, looks at that mechanism as a way of perhaps treating uh, patients with, with schizophrenia and perhaps rectifying delusions and, and possibly anhedonia. And the reason that we think delusions and anhedonia relate to this theory is that patients with delusions um, form, as you know, odd beliefs about the world. And patients with anhedonia find it very hard to act on their beliefs. And I think those two things are related. Um, we know, for example, that people learn from their mistakes, and they learn most in, the, in situations when their um, mistakes are largest, if you like. We, uh, we found in a study using functional neuroimaging that patients with schizophrenia have a prediction error signal in their brain when there really ought not to be one there. So, for example, they're surprised by events in a task that really aren't that surprising. And the more surprised they are, the more severe their delusional beliefs are. 
Mm-hmm. So we think that delusions form as a way of making the world a little bit more predictable um, for patients with schizophrenia. It's a way of explaining their odd experiences, if you like. Um, and if you have a problem in making predictions, it's obviously quite difficult to act um, rationally and to, uh, to use your beliefs about the world to guide you through it and to help you make decisions. So much so that perhaps negative symptoms and anhedonia are a manifestation of just having a very unpredictable world and, and the, the needing to withdraw from that world, if you like. Wow. I, I never thought about it that way until I, I hear you say this and, and, and read your proposal. That's, that's very fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so how will you test whether your theory of how delusions form is correct? So we use a, a technique called functional neuroimaging. It's essentially a way of measuring um, blood flow to different parts of the brain uh, using a very strong magnet. So oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have different paramagnetic qualities. It means that they behave differently in, in, in high uh, magnetic fields. Um, we can give people tasks to do while they're in the scanner and we take pictures of their brains whilst they do those tasks. One of the tasks that we use uh, is, is uh, involves forming causal beliefs about a fictitious patient. So patients are brought to the, to, to the scanner, asked to imagine that they're an allergist, um, told that they need to figure out the cause of allergic reactions in, in a new fictitious patient. So on a particular trial in the task, we can show them uh, pictures of the foods that the patient's eaten, and then we can show them whether or not the patient suffers from an allergic reaction. And so across repetitions of those trials, Patients can learn which foods tend to make them have allergies and which ones don't. And we can confirm or violate those expectations. And what we found previously with this task in patients with schizophrenia and also in people um, treated with um, a drug called ketamine, which models some of the symptoms of schizophrenia, that those error signals in patients' brains and in people on ketamine start to be engaged when they really ought not to be there. So events that most people would not find to be surprising uh, are found to be surprising by people with schizophrenia and by people given ketamine. And the more that those uh, error signals are inappropriately engaged, the more severe the delusional beliefs were uh, in, in our patient sample. Okay. So, uh, so that, that's, uh, that's encouraging to see that that is, is likely to be correct. Um, so how, how does this... Um lead to your proposal to, to test uh, a, a new therapy potential, potentially for schizophrenia in patients um, in the lab? Mm-hmm. So we know that um, from working in animals, the, the dopamine system is strongly involved in this uh, predicting and prediction error process. Um, the cells in the midbrain uh, that release dopamine uh, release more dopamine uh, when animals' expectations are violated. Uh, we know that dopamine is implicated in, uh, in schizophrenia, most of the drugs uh, that have antipsychotic properties block the D2 subtype of, of dopamine receptors. Um, there's a new uh, drug that's FDA approved for epilepsy called ritigabine, uh, which actually opens up potassium channels. And we know that potassium channels uh, are, are one way through which neurons can specify their predictions uh, about their incoming inputs. And um, perhaps by modulating the way that that system works, uh, we can restore patient's ability uh, to, to make predictions about the world and, and, and to respond to the world in a more adaptive manner. Amazing. So you could act maybe this drug by um, ritigabine by uh, modulating the neurons can modulate somebody's mental processes in a more healthy way and restore them and, and hopefully reduce the delusions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's exciting. Um, so, so since FDA has already approved uh, ritigabine as a drug for use in humans for epilepsy, um, d- does that potentially mean anything for it to maybe be available sooner for patients rather than something that is just kind of uh, uh, looking at, looking at a, a protein or developing in a new compound? Right. So the fact that it's approved will, will make, uh, obviously, uh, things move a little bit more quickly and, and smoothly, but of course this study is just the first in, 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 in that long process. I do think it will be more efficient though, given that it's already been approved. Okay, that's encouraging. That's, that's great. So, uh, and since your experiments will uh, involve human volunteers, is there any potential for um, 
viewers who have schizophrenia or viewers with family members who have schizophrenia to get in involved in your in your experiments? Absolutely. Um, obviously, it would be easier if they lived near to New Haven um, because that's where I'm based at Yale. Uh, but I, I'd love to hear from from people who who are interested in our work and want to know more about it. They can find me on the web. Uh, my my lab is the Belief Learning and Memory Lab or BLAM Lab at Yale, uh, which they can uh, find find me through Google. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, it's, it's been great having you on Brainwaves and uh, for explaining all this for, to everybody. Uh, now, do you, do you have any, um, if, any, if people have any questions for you online uh, after I post this video, will you be ready to answer some questions? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Okay, thanks, Phil. Uh, thank thanks you. again for appearing on Brainwaves. My pleasure. Have a good one. You too. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.